you cannot influence anything else. X bar is what my data is, and S is right for my data as well, standard deviation. So there's only two things I can use, uh, sorry, two things I can change to the shoe I found in, and that is choose a different level of confidence. That is what the term of CT is. So the level of confidence in terms of CT is and my number of samples. So I can take fewer samples, and my value is wider, or I can take more samples, and my value is higher. So it gives the mission in terms of that. So that's two important points from the last class that you must understand. And then we emphasize additionally here again today that the interpretation will be used very, very careful. It's the probability that that range is low enough to come down contains the true population. So that is a is a bound for the population So if you turn the slides to uh, 65, here's just a summary of that discussion from the last time, which says that you don't have the true standard deviation signal in all cases. And most times we don't have that. So we have to assume two things. Firstly, our data are in and then if we don't know what sigma is, we have to assume our data comes from the normal distribution. We have a convenient way to check for that now that this is Okay, so those are the two cases there. Either you know sigma, which I said is very theoretical, very abstract, that's not going to ever be your situation. All likely is that the sigma is estimated, so then you use S, which is our estimate of sigma, and you have both those assumptions true that X bar is that was our discussion yesterday out on the next class. Okay, so um, <coughs> if you use that formula to get what you really have here on the slides, there's no need to go over this um, sequence now. So just to repeat that here on the board, that the bounds are determined by CT and the intent. Um, that's okay, so if you're wondering how to calculate CT, that is from R or from table. Uh, in an exam test you're using the table, there's obviously going to be some error in there, so just pick a value from the table that's closest to the one you're dealing with. If you're doing it in an assignment or in your project later on, obviously you put R in front of you and you should be using the QT function to get a more exact value. Okay, so there's many other types of
I want you to start to engage your mind along this line of experimentation. Many of you have already, in fact, emailed me and suggested ideas for your experiments and projects that are going to come to in March. Okay. So some of you are starting to think of getting that phrase. I'd like to see more of those discussions by email with you. But if you look back in this course, by the time you start studying the material with April for the exam, you're going to look back and you're going to say, well, hang on, it looks like most of this course is about statistics, most of this course really is about experiments. And that's true. We're going to learn a lot of the statistical tools as they apply to experiments. And the reason why we do that is because experiments are extremely costly and we don't get a chance to do them very often. So when we do them, we want to make very, very sure we're doing them right and doing them well. So today's discussion is kind of setting a good example of that. So here's the case study we're going to consider. We're going to look at alternatives, testing one alternative versus another. So for example, we want to use a material B that's cheaper than the existing material A. Does that new material B work as well? Some of you that are in civil engineering have approached me about projects related to concrete. So if you use a different additive, will your concrete strength still be the same? Okay, statistically, how do you judge that? Chemical engineers, you want to use a new catalyst B, does it improve the product properties if you use that catalyst B? Catalyst B is going to cost you more money, is it worth the additional cost? Okay, taking a 407. Because I'm not taking the course, and it doesn't save you time. So in previous years, I've given the class um, the data that I used to uh, drive to Mississauga. I would take the four seven some days, other days I wouldn't. And so they did statistical tests and showed that taking the four seven, in my case, was saving nine minutes every day, on average. So there's a clear cut example where A versus B gave a significant difference. Okay, so for example, it might be the case that taking the four seven. This is this case B is not taking the 407, so there's a, there's, it's a no-brainer. Taking the 407 saves you time. You don't even have to do a statistical test to judge whether this case A is different from B. It's, it's so obvious in the raw data itself. Here's a different, uh, we're going to see a different example later on where that overlap now is much closer. You've already seen that, for example, in the assignment when you compare the tests, results, so we're going to look at that sort of detail idea today. And to look at that detail, I'm going to use a single example for the rest of today's class. This is an actual example. So you as the engineer, you need to verify that a new feedback controller, controller B, that you're going to apply on your batch reactor works better than the existing feedback controller A. So one of the feedback companies like Aspen or ISIS or GE, they come to you and they say, we've got this new device, this new feedback controller, put it on your batch reactor, and we're sure that it's going to improve the yield that you get from your batch. Okay. Now, a bat each batch takes three days to run. So they're saying, we'll give it to you for a month. That means you can do about 10 runs. They'll lend you this controller for 10, uh, for 10 batches, and you can give it a go and see whether it works better or worse, or no difference. Now, if you choose to buy that feedback controller afterwards, it's going to cost you $400,000. That's typical prices for these systems. And there's an annual maintenance fee of $40,000 for the software license. Okay, so your boss comes to you and is asking you to evaluate this decision. You need to make a recommendation you don't want to be the idiot that recommends the system that later on doesn't work out. Okay, because this is costing $400,000. So you've got your reputation to maintain. You've got 10 data points. How are you going to do this? So let's take a look. Guarantee every engineer out there will do something as follows. They'll go and say to Aspen, OK, you're giving it to us for a month. Put it on our system, we'll run 10 batches, and we're going to measure the data. So here's the data. On the left-hand side is the system with 
without the new feedback controller, in other words, your existing process. <coughs> so you get yields of 92.7 one day, then 73, then 80 percent, then 81 percent, and so on. So the average <coughs> yield is about 20 percent on that process. And there's a standard deviation of 6.8 minutes. So then Aspen comes to your company, they put the feedback controller on over the weekend. For the next month, you use that feedback controller and you get 83% yield, 79%, 82, so on, and the average yield then is 83%, let's say, just round up. So average yield is 83% with the new control system, the existing control system is 80%. So your improved yield on your process is about 3%. So if one month of data gives you 82, 83%, another month of data on the existing system. You do a bit of calculation, so Dr. Marlin's process control textbook shows how to do this. We learned about it in QP. That that 3% converts over to about a million dollars worth of savings. And if you do 4M, you figure the payback time is.
you'll show those differences with the dot plot. It's a histogram. But you show every difference by one dot. So there's 281 dots in this. So for example, this dot over here on minus 5 indicates that somewhere along your data set you had a difference between 10 and 10 successive batches of minus 5 units. The difference of, say, plus 7 units means you had that difference of plus 7. So you can go plot your historical differences. And what you'll see then, remember our difference with the new control system was 3%. So how many batches in the past did we get the difference of 3% or greater purely by chance, or purely based on the natural variation in the system? We can quickly find that, that there's 31 batches of those 281 that lie to the right of that 31. So 31 batches by chance, or based on historical data, had had the difference in the yield that was better than this new feedback control system. Are you not considering plus? Because our new system from Aspel is negative. It gave us a 3% improvement. But if the batch hasn't had a negative, it's a 3% improvement. Well, so what we're, we're trying to judge is whether the new system, we, remember we got a yield from the new system of 83%. The old system gave us 80%, so we had a plus 3% improvement in the yield. So what I've done is I calculated historical differences, and sometimes my differences are positive, sometimes my differences are negative. So a positive difference implies that the, the last 10 batches were better than the previous 10 on average. A negative difference implies that the first 10 batches were better than the next 10. So on average, you'll see that my difference is zero, which is what I would expect, because this is the same control system. Okay, so... Okay, so why don't you consider those that are negative for you? Because the value is the first batch better than the other one. Yeah, the other one, the other one, the other one, the other one, the other one. Because we're making one decision. We're making one decision of what is the ability built into our process of seeing 10 successive batches that are better than 10 successive batches prior to it. So we're comparing 10 batches of old data to 10 batches coming after it. We want to see what's the normal variation in our process of seeing that improvement by chance. We're not looking at the question the other way around. So it takes a little while to, to sink in, but Bear in mind that what we're doing here is exactly what we're doing with the new control system versus the old control system. We put the old control system on, then the new one. So when you make your historical checks, you have to compare old data to new data. Okay, so it takes a little while for this methodology to sink in, but uh, play around with, try and reconstruct that graph mentally, and I'll give you a little bit. Data are actually real data. They come from an actual process. But what we did was 
we calculated what the parameter of autocorrelation was from the theoretical data and we simulated data to match that historical data. So we often do this in statistics as we create synthetic data that has the same characteristics as the real data set so that we can do our analysis more carefully. Okay, so this, this parameter of 0.3 came from an actual process of later. Now I would like to just take a look a bit at how we can analyze that data if we happen to have no historical data. So if you only used your 10 data points from system A and the 10 data points from system B. And the reason why I want to look at this is because this introduces the idea of a hypothesis test. So you've learned about hypothesis tests. I would actually like you to forget everything you learned about hypothesis tests because they're really a bad way of judging any sort of change in the system. I'm going to show you a far better way that's far more intuitive with the same example. So let's take a look at it. The thinking here is as follows. So we'll come back to what's on the slides in a minute. But the thinking is, is this. Let's say for now that you have a system where A and B are identical. There's no difference. So there's the histogram for A and the histogram for system B is identical. So mu A is equal to mu B. What the test for differences does is it's asking if you take a sample from A and a sample from B, whether they're different. So here's the truth. I'm showing you on the board these two systems are identical. So if I take a sample from system A, I get that green square. And if I take a sample from system B, I'm going to get that orange square. There's my two values. I take a sample of NA data points. And I take a sample of MB data points, and I get those particular values of the, of the average. What I can do is I can go calculate this distance between those two averages. So x bar A and x bar B. Another way you can write that is to say that distance in yellow is xp bar minus xA bar. So there's one particular data point that differs. That one, this will correspond to taking, say, for example, 10 samples from system A, 10 samples from system B, calculate the average of each of those 10 data points, subtract the averages, and you're left with a single number over there. Most cases, that's all the data we have. We cannot go repeat the experiment because we don't have the time to do it. Let's say we live in a in an ideal case where we've got infinite time and money and we can go repeat that experiment. So we go to do that and then now in green we go repeat the experiment and I get that point there, the green triangle comes from system A and I switch to system B and I get the orange triangle. So now my distance from B to A is the other way around. So I go, I go recalculate this. This time xb minus xa, the first time around was positive. The next time I repeated this, I calculated xb minus xa, and I got a negative value. So this is my first time, this is my second time. And I can go and repeat this a third, or fourth, or fifth time. Simply at a point so that by the time I'm finished here, you can see no need to so my first experiment was squares, my second experiment was triangles. Okay. Then I go repeat this work the third time, I'm going to use circles now. So the third time I do this work, I go use circles and I get this point over there as my average for xa, and I get xb my average over here. So the distance now between them Third time, x b minus x a r is positive. So 
So I can go repeat this over and over, and for systems that are where there's no difference between A and B, the underlying true distribution happens to be identical, half the time you're going to get a difference that's positive, and 50% of the time you're going to get a difference that's negative. Does everyone agree on that point, at the very least? Even though you may not understand that construction over there, consider systems that are identical. You take a sample one time, take a sample again a few days later, take another sample from two systems a few days later still, sometimes you're going to get a positive difference, sometimes you're going to get a negative difference. Half the time, your long-term probability is that half the time you're going to get a positive difference, half the time you're going to get a negative difference. That's what our aim is here, is to understand what our probabilities are of seeing difference at any certain sign. So let's consider this case. Let's consider now a situation where we're testing whether the difference between system B and system A is positive. In other words, did we make a significant improvement? Or another way you can say that is that U B minus U A is positive. We prefer to write it as this. We're testing whether the difference between U B minus A is positive. So we make a few assumptions. Assume that the data from system A and system B are normally distributed. Assume the data from sample A and sample B have the same standard deviation. Let's, given those first two assumptions, we can then use the central limit theorem and say that the sample A is from a normal distribution of the mean of UA and the variance C squared. And sample B is from also the normal distribution of the different mean. Same variance. Now, the central limit theorem tells us also that we can calculate the sort of variances, that it, there they are, sigma squared A over NA, if the data are independent. Now, I will come back to the case where the data are not independent. But let's assume the data are independent. If that holds, now we have that XA bar and XB bar are independent. That's very likely true. It's very simple to understand that. A system where you calculate the average of a group of points, that's the average of the group of points, and the average of the next group of points are very likely going to be independent. More likely than, than uh, the raw data itself. Now, there's this rule in statistics that the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. If that's simply a, a, an expression of that rule, so before that, that's a basic stats, uh, basic stats theorem. So the variance of the sum of two variables, all the different, the sum is the same thing just assigned to it. The variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. And so the variance of xb bar minus xa bar is that expression. The only thing that should probably give you a little bit of trouble right now on the slide is that point number six, the same value. Well, it's not really too of a new concept over there. It simply says Z is a variable where you take some number, XB minus XA, minus the mean divided through by the standard deviation. So everything in that denominator there is a standard deviation. It's a standard deviation because it's simply the square root of the variance. So there's my variance term over there in point five, take the square root of that. So that's my denominator. And my numerator says xb bar minus xa bar minus that term in brackets, ub minus ub. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, we're creating a z value for the difference. Okay, and z values, we can create z values for any variable. It just happens to be that the variable I'm choosing to create a z value for is this difference between x average from A and X average from B. Okay. And the reason why that's a variable is quite easy to see. Take a look back here at the board, where we say, where we repeat these experiments, every time I do the experiment, I'm going to get a different value from XB bar minus XA bar. Repeat the experiments, I'm going to get a different value, different value. Sometimes I'm going to get long distances, sometimes I'm going to get short distances, sometimes I'm going to get them flipping in sign, xb bar minus xa bar is a variable. Okay. 
the moment we've got a variable, we can calculate the distribution that that variable comes from. And what we're doing here simply is calculating the z value for that variable. So the z value for this variable is as shown over here on the slide. And what we're simply asking is the moment we've got a z value, we call from our discussion a few months ago, is my z value. We can calculate probabilities for that z. We can calculate the probability of observing a z value for example, that's at minus one or smaller. Or we can calculate the probability of z value equal to zero or smaller. What's the probability of z equal to zero or smaller? 50%. What's the probability of a z value equal to one or smaller? 100%. So we, we spoke about that one last, about three classes ago. What is the probability of a z value 1 or greater? 15%, OK? So very well, it's, it's of average probability to get a z value equal to 0. So take a look back at this example. If I calculate these differences, and the underlying histograms are identical to each other, I should get z's that are positive sometimes, z's that are negative sometimes. So I'm going to get z's that on average, if I had enough time and money and repeated that experiment over and over, I'm going to get z's that tend to have a mean of zero. Okay. Does that make sense? So a system where there's no difference between them, between system B and A, if I keep calculating that difference x b bar minus x a bar, I'm going to see z values that on average will be negative, sometimes will be smaller, but on average it's going to be zero. What we're going to ask then is what is the probability of getting the z value for our specific data set? So if we go back to the data set we got from our control, feedback control example, we can calculate the z value for that data set. And once we have that z value, we can ask ourselves, what are the odds of getting this z value? And if the odds are extremely low or extremely high, we can make our decision accordingly. I'll show you how we observe that z value. So I'm going to skip over these slides so you can see this um, AD pattern in your notes. Skip over about three or four slides. It's a side discussion. We'll come back to that next time. With this, with this um, section is we're back here at point number six, which is the same. It's just a summary of the five slides. What we're going to end up doing is in fact creating a confidence interval for that z value. So value by now and based on the assignments and based on the class on Monday, we need to start getting quite comfortable with confidence intervals. What we're going to essentially do here is build a confidence interval, not for the average but for the difference in averages. So notice that my confidence interval, I'm going to find a lower bound and an upper bound that contains this difference in means. We will never know mu b. Okay? Putting Aspen's feedback control system on our process, we will never know that true average. We will never know the true yield of our process. But what we want to do is calculate a confidence interval for the difference in those means. That's our goal here. Okay. Let's take a look at this example that's on the board. Here's an example where we know, theoretically, that the two needs are identical. So notice here, if this were true, this term over here is going to be zero. And this is my left-hand side of the inequality, and this is the right-hand side of the inequality. I just didn't have space to put it side by side. Okay? But here I should get a negative number, and here I should get a positive number. If that confidence interval, we say, if that confidence interval spans zero, or has zero within the confidence interval, is another way of saying it. If the confidence interval spans zero, 
and that's a 95% confidence interval, that corroborates what I'm observing here. So if this was my true situation, and x p minus x a, I got my x p bar data, I get my x a bar data, I go ahead and calculate the confidence interval, I know of those terms, x p bar, x a bar, cn I look up on tables, sigma squared we'll talk about in a minute, n a and n b I know. So I can calculate the lower bound, I can calculate the upper bound, and if the lower bound and upper bound take span zero, then I say there's a there's my, my true mean rise between the lower bound and upper bound. Okay, I've got evidence now to say that that bound contains the difference of zero. In the feedback control system, we don't want a, that lower bound and upper bound to contain zero. Right? Think back to the app to that feedback control data. If that lower bound and upper bound contain zero, Let's say my lower bound was minus 1, and my upper bound was plus 4. What's that telling you about the feedback control system? So let me, let me wind it up here, just so you can visualize it as well.
that confidence interval is symmetric around zero. There's great evidence there in those two numeric values that the underlying histograms are pretty much identical. Take a look at this. What if you got this result?